On behalf of the uh, Content Advisory Board and the organizers, I want to uh, welcome you to uh, the conference. And we've got three great tracks the next two uh, days that are going on. One of the best things as a conference organizer is being able to see the, all of the uh, reactions on Twitter and the emails coming back and forth, and everybody talking about how difficult it is to decide which talks you're going to go to. Uh, that means we've done pretty well for lining up a set of speakers uh, for you this uh, event. Don't worry if you can't make all the talks, which physically is impossible. We are actually recording all of the talks, and they will be made available later externally, as well as internally. Uh, we'll put that out through the Blue Hat blog and the Twitter handles as those go up. So without, uh, with that out of the way, let me introduce Eric Dorr, the general manager of MSRC, to say a couple of words for you. Let's see if my mic works. All right, it does. Hey, I'm Eric. Uh, I just wanted to take a minute and uh, welcome everybody here and, uh, and re kind of reflect on one point, which is that if anything, over the last couple of years with the crazy events we've all been through, uh, as, as cyber gets more and more insane and uh, adversaries get smarter and smarter and sometimes less careful about what they're doing, to me, it's really highlighted that the need for collaboration, we just need to take it up a notch. And all the good collaboration we're doing between various parts of the industry, it's not enough, and we need to redouble our efforts to do even more. Um, this Blue Hat is a small piece of that puzzle. I think there's many, many pieces that happen across the industry. And so I want to thank the talented researchers who are here, you know, contributing their time and energy to help educate us and make us smarter about what's going on. We've got a ton of great partners in the room who work with us to help defend customers, and a ton of engineers across Microsoft who work every day to try to build software that people love and that keeps people safe. And so thank you all to this event. Let's uh, challenge ourselves to push the envelope on, on collaboration, meet a couple extra people, and you know, share some ideas and best practices, and hope you guys have a great time. Thanks. Like Eric said, community is one of the biggest things that we get out of Blue Hat. This is one of my favorite events every year because of the people that are, we bring together for this. So we've included more opportunities. Uh, afternoon, this evening, at 5 o'clock, there's a mixer inside of Baker uh, with drinks. Take the opportunity to meet some new people here and get some uh, fresh ideas. With that in mind, I'd like to introduce to you our keynote speaker for today, uh, bringing in a new uh, perspective for us. Chris Deibler, from, uh, who's the director of security for Twitch, will go ahead and bring him up on the stage and let you hear about his talk. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Uh, I should probably have the clicker. There's a lot of slides. Cool, so um, this is a very informal talk. So I encourage you to uh, yell whatever comes to your mind at the appropriate moments where yelling is appropriate. Um, if you're encouraged to heckle, sorry? Yes, thank you, Kirk. Uh, Kirk uh, is an engineer on my cert, and this was a mistake. So <laughs> moving on, uh, the title of this talk is This Is Not Fine, Surviving Cynicism and Building Happy Security Teams, uh, which is one of the only things that I think I actually have uh, any genuine talent at in this world, and so I'd like to share that with you. Um, this deck represents about 30 minutes of content that has been carefully and painstakingly crammed into a 16-minute uh, speaking slot, and so it's going to be riddled with awkward pauses <laughs> and nonsensical imagery, such as this. <laughs> so uh, the genesis of this talk was a conversation uh, with someone here uh, that went something like this, where I said, uh, hey, I didn't know you are in security. That's awesome. Uh, and they said, yeah. Security's great, to which I responded, that's weird, I'm burnt the hell out. Uh, the, the chuckles there are concerning, perhaps you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and they said, you know what, you should write a deck about it and talk about it, um, which is why we're now here today. Uh, so um, I would have liked to have a cursive font in PowerPoint online to do that, uh, but I couldn't, so it was all stenciled. What this talk actually is, um, it's a talk about combating cynicism in the security space and what you can do about it and how that motivates teams and other teams. Because at the end of the day, 
Cynicism is one of the great killers um, of a security community, of a security team, uh, productivity, outputs, outcomes, the whole nine yards. Um, and having an open attitude to how you approach your job is extraordinarily important. And I want to do um, a quick survey of the lay of the land here. Um, if you are a people manager, uh, people manager, you have uh, people in your charge, you care and feed their growth and development, do their performance reviews, uh, et cetera, just raise your hand real quick. I'd like to see the, the people management load out. All right, so that's back of the envelope. That's less than a fifth of the room, maybe less than a sixth of the room. Um, this talk's not for you. If you are an individual contributor, but you have designs on people management in your career, do please raise your hand. Three people? Four? <laughs> it's, it's more like 12. Um, this talk's actually for you, uh, because the transition, was not, uh, the transition was not easy for me and smart for me. And for the rest of you in the room uh, who want to be buried uh, in IC forever, that's awesome. Uh, coincidentally, any people managers in here want to go back to being in IC, raise your hand. There we go. That guy knows what's up. All right, so uh, no, uh, no slide deck is complete without an origin story, and origin stories fill the time uh, lovely, and so that's where we're going to uh, go here. So this is where I came from, but first let me tell you what I am not. I am not a licensed therapist, uh, and I have uh, no real ability to set you straight in any way. Uh, however, you can buy that couch on Target for $399.99. It's a fainting couch. Um, I'm not a certified financial planner, uh, do not take any of this as career advice. I do not know how to build you wealth other than Bitcoin Connect is going to go up and to the right. <laughs> According to that screenshot, I am not a physician. Obviously, just look at me. And finally, I'm not an attorney. And most pertinent to this talk, I am not your attorney. Do not take anything I have done in my past life as licensed to do the same. Uh, what I am is the director of security for Twitch.tv. Um, I didn't really do any slides on what Twitch is, uh, but I'm sure that you can, you can hit the internet and figure that out. Uh, we are the largest purveyor of live video content on the internet, somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 terabit, uh, depending on how you use our pops. So a lot of volume. Um, I run, amongst other things, the engineering and architecture team. I'm responsible for the recognition, categorization, and ablation of long-term security debt, Twitch being a startup that was acquired has a lot of long-term security debt, and that is one of my problems to deal with through my ArchEng team. I have an application security team, which is something that many of you here probably map very closely to, uh, which is how do we make sure that our product uh, is the most secure product it could be when it walks out the front door, uh, sometimes planfully and sometimes through random CI, CD. It's just a thing that plagues many people. Um, I have a secure development team, uh, which is in charge of making sure that the right internal product-facing features are available for engineers to create secure products. For instance, uh, I own, through my SecDev team, our secrets management system, our service-to-service -service authentication system, uh, and a number of other bits and pieces uh, that are appropriate for internal teams to use. And finally, uh, I have the security incident response team for Twitch. Uh, and in a bid for hubris, I have also invited the CERT along today. CERT, please go ahead and wave. Thank you. Hi, guys. I hope the site's doing OK. How's Carl? Is he okay? Any sev twos? Great. So, um, certs here. Uh, that, is, uh, that is what I do. Uh, so, previously uh, to this, I was director of security at Box. Anyone here from Box previously, current? No? Box is a really cool gig uh, to be in charge of anything at because Box is a threat aggregator, uh, which is a polite way of saying that if you want to get inside General Electric uh, and look at their files in their MilGov stuff, you have two opportunities available to you. You can compromise General Electric, or you can go compromise Box, which contains much of the same content. Uh, so Box is, of course, the aggregation of all of its customer threat actors and threat models, and therefore has a very interesting problem uh, on its hands. Prior to that, I was uh, principal security architect at Zynga. Uh, the poker studio was my, uh, my primary charge. Uh, Zynga was really cool. Any ex uh, Zyngaites here, uh, current or former? Uh, not seeing any hands here. Zynga was a user aggregator. Uh, and though many people would argue that Zynga was a game company, I argue that it was not. Uh, Zynga was a scaling company. Zynga allowed a small game studio to go from concept to prototype to a launch candidate and then in one week's calendar time, be at 90 million MAU. Just absolutely astounding, with no infrastructure pre-built um, to support that. Uh, Zynga knew how to scale. 
um, greater than, than almost anyone other than people in the cloud business, such as the people here at uh, Microsoft Cloud, AWS, obviously, maybe those Google guys, I don't know. Um, prior to that, I was principal security engineer at PayPal, uh, where I lived through the Operation Payback campaign, uh, which is when Anonymous decided uh, that did, did not like uh, PayPal's funding rules uh, against various groups online uh, and tried to bring the site down. Uh, fortunately, at that time, Anonymous did not know about SSL, uh, and that went largely uh, problem-free. Um, before that, I was doing literally every role at a security startup um, and failing horribly at it because I had literally no qualifications to do anything. And if you look at these four bullet points here, um, only one of them is actually interesting and the one that we're going to talk about, uh, which is the doing literally everything uh, for a startup here. Everything else you can read in, in, in any book anywhere. So uh, in the year of our Lord 2000, which is when I got started on my security path, um, this was a real conversation with a real recruiter. Um, Dave Keener doesn't know that he's in this deck. Uh, this is Dave's LinkedIn photo. I'd like to thank him for, for making that public. Uh, Dave was the founder uh, and later CISO uh, of this company, a company named Vigilant Minds, later purchased by Solutionary, later purchased by uh, uh, NTT, uh, and uh, so it goes. After posting my resume, uh, do I mention this in my notes? I don't. After posting my resume uh, on monster.com, uh, which is very much like LinkedIn minus Facebook, um, I got a phone call. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that one was going to land. Um, Dave asked, hey, would you like a security job? Uh, to which I said, obviously, yes, that sounds like fun. Uh, and Dave said, do you know Nmap? To which I said, no. Uh, and then Dave said, oh, well, OK, well, do you know Nessus? To which I also said, no. And then Dave said, this has been a fun conversation. <laughs> Have you ever had a job interview that both you and the interviewer were totally on the same wavelength without any conversation whatsoever that you had completely bombed the interview and it was going to be okay and you could both walk away and go your separate ways with no further conversation? That was this interview. But then Dave said something really weird. He said, by the way, um, this is my IP address, which I didn't really understand uh, as a challenge at the time. Uh, and in hindsight, had that not actually been a challenge and just some really weird, awkward, awkward social construct, it's like, no, it's a pleasure to meet you. 12.24. Uh, uh, <laughs> so uh, the next day at work, uh, I destroyed our domain. Uh, I was working as uh, an IT tech at a large regional electric contractor, <clears throat> as one does. And uh, the first thing I did that morning was I took our backup domain controller, uh, Windows NT4, uh, offline. And I installed the lethal cyber weapons platform of the age on it, Red Hat Linux 5.2. Uh, and then I decided maybe I should go look up that Nmap thing uh, that Dave was talking about. And I think I should point out at this point that all of this occurred over dial-up. That is a real live Courier 56K modem that you can purchase from Dell.com right now for $269.99. Uh, and you can like, they, they stack really nicely and you can have one go to each branch office. Point being, this all happened over Microsoft Routing RAS, uh, which is also a lethal cyber weapons platform. So um, after end mapping Dave's server, uh, I discovered a whole bunch of exposed RPC. Uh, and back in those days, you could search Lycos or Alta Vista and find security focus. Does anyone remember security focus? Does anyone actually use that guy back there knows what's up? <laughs> and it turns out you can go to security focus and you can find all sorts of snippets of code that do questionable things if you were not C fluent, which at that point in my uh, life, I was not. Uh, but it turns out all of these things uh, compiled. Does anyone want to guess what I ran? Uh, my age cohort, this is going to be late 2000, works on any Linux, RPC stat D, anyone know the CVE offhand? That's too bad. It was CVE 2666. Uh, everyone remembers their first. And again, I'd like to point out, do not try this at home. So uh, I rooted Dave's server, uh, and I did horrible things to it. <laughs> Reasonably certain I, uh, I, I RM'd Etsy, and that was the end of that. And then it worked for no one. So um, one month later, I was a security professional, and here we are now. <laughs> So that's not where it ended. Uh, I, I did have a, a, a nice, fun life of crime uh, after that, uh, doing security consulting, mostly red team work uh, before I got on a blue team. 
Um, immediately after that, upon starting my real job in the security industry, I was asked to compromise a vendor uh, of custom hats and shirts, so a, a swag vendor where you could upload your images, uh, JPEG at the time, uh, or BMP, uh, and get those put on your things. And I knew absolutely nothing about web application security uh, whatsoever, but I did know how to be lazy. Uh, and so I found the path of least resistance, and I called their DNS operator and asked them to change the A record for their website to my laptop under my desk, <laughs> which I considered a fairly effective compromise of their website. Unfortunately, they agreed. Uh, what I did not factor into that was now their site operation demanded my laptop be up 24-7. So <laughs> didn't think that one through. Um, afterwards, uh, physical penetration testing, large uh, Midwestern industrial tools uh, contractor. If you want to build a tool, um, you need a really strong tool to, to forge or cut that tool. And these guys make the tools that forge those tools that forge those tools. So lots of high-end industrial process. Um, got into one of their branch offices uh, and managed to drop a wireless access point in their lobby so I could, again, lazy, uh, do all the rest of my work from their parking lot, um, not having put any sort of authentication on the wireless access point and realizing halfway through the three-hour drive home that I had left their production network exposed to the internet over Wi-Fi. Um, so I had another hour and a half drive back in the opposite direction uh, to go fix that. <clears throat> so here's where we start getting on the real topic here. Um, and if we've got more time, there are always more war stories. Um, there's always more time for beer and war stories. Um, this sort of background in how you get into this career, in my opinion, is a strong generator of cynicism. Um, it subtly laid uh, the background, which is what my slide says here. Um, here's a quote. Um, it cannot possibly be this easy. All I had to do to show up. And if you remember a lot about red teaming in 2000, the, <laughs> I mean, yeah, all you did have to do was show up. You could not stumble over a class C without running into 15, 16 things um, that were extraordinary. Um, and if you're still on red team, you actually may still be living this bias. The world may still be extraordinarily easy for you, and you do not realize the position of privilege that puts you in um, from a security thought perspective. Um, another quote here is, companies aren't even trying. Uh, again, just scan through a class, you find 15 interesting things. Um, it's not that the companies weren't trying, it's that no one knew what the hell they were doing in 2000. You can argue that we don't know what we're doing right now. Um, the frontier of, of where the thought is, I mean, how many, how many Intel microcode vulnerabilities have we had in the last calendar year? I mean, the frontier keeps moving back. There's always somewhere where we don't know what we're doing. At the time, I didn't think anyone was even uh, trying. And um, that generates a sense of hubris uh, in myself, I suspect, in other red teams. Uh, where you think all of this is skill. Uh, in, in one of my most fantastic cell phones, um, we actually produced shirts with the list of our compromised targets uh, on the back of them at this, uh, at this company, not really understanding what we were actually saying. Uh, it's a very powerful feeling, but it's also a very cynical feeling. So um, I eventually moved into uh, people management, and uh, it's when I was hired at Box uh, to architect the program. Uh, simultaneously with that, uh, Box lost uh, their managing director uh, on leave, and that leave turned out to be permanent. And so, uh, by chance, I inherited a, a team of 10 highly skilled engineers. Uh, most of them are still there, uh, love them dearly, uh, and their roadmap. And though um, we hired a new director to take over that program eventually, uh, my path towards people management at that point was pretty set in stone because the challenges that I was now undertaking, I had no formal background in, I had no experience in, and they were all very difficult and all highly exciting. Um, and so from that background, um, from that position, I am going to give you um, what I feel, uh, as I mentioned very early in the talk, you know, this is a conversation about cynicism and counter cynicism and, and how to think about cynicism in your enterprise with your customers, however you have to do it. Um, I wanna talk about uh, what I actually learned about any of that and see if I can crystallize that into something that's useful for you. Um, and the first thing you do uh, is you need to be able to identify cynicism within your own program because there's nowhere else that you're going to be more qualified to actually identify that. Um, so this is just one of those uh, random things where everyone raises their hand on demand. Uh, I would just love to know if you have heard any quote or a quote that is substantially like one of these in your workplace, in a customer's workplace, anywhere else in your immediate proximity. And if you really wanna be that person, you can put up two hands if you've said it yourself, but this is not 
This is not a shame talk, so do not feel obligated. So here's, here's the first. Um, everything is on fire. <laughs> a lot of double hands from the back of the room. All right, that's, uh, that's common. Uh, this won't get better under the current management. A lot of double hands. Where do you guys work? Not a shame talk. Um, those clowns don't know what they're doing. I feel like you guys could give this talk. You know what I'm talking about. All right. Those clowns are resting and vesting. Now we see my acquisition people. All right, you get that. And uh, finally, and most dangerously, those clowns are arguing in bad faith. Getting a couple. All right, we're going to talk about the one. So let's, uh, let's run back through here. Everything is on fire. Is it, though? Is it actually on fire? Because there are things that you are supposed to be doing when something is on fire. Um, flaming people don't stand still and gripe about things being on fire. Things that are on fire, they run up, they, they call 911. They, they rush to the sprinkler or to the, uh, to, the, to the fire extinguisher and they run into the server room and hope the halon doesn't go off. And is that still a thing, halon? Probably not. Um, this points uh, very strongly to the challenges of matching escalation pace. Uh, and what I mean by that, this is an actual uh, conversation that I've had uh, with my L10 uh, that I report to very recently. Sorry, that's a very Amazonian term. Uh, uh, senior, senior VP, exec VP, probably uh, most important equivalent. Uh, to which I said, uh, Ethan, I cannot get people to move on this SEV2. It's been open for X. X is embarrassing, so I'm not going to tell you the number. Um, and Ethan said, you know, that's funny. Uh, if you were treating this as a SEV2, uh, why haven't you been in my inbox every day? You know, that's actually a really fair point. Um, it's easy to say that something is on fire. Uh, it is much harder to act like something is on fire. Uh, and so I consider uh, everything is on fire to be a cynical entry uh, into a lot of things. Um, does your organization have a standard for fire? Because this conversation becomes much easier if you can define fire um, outside of combustion and combustion products. Uh, in Amazon affiliated companies, uh, we have a very uh, clear definition uh, of what is on fire uh, via internal severity. Um, and the odds are that if you're responding to a SEV1 uh, that lives in your org, yes, that's actually true. Your world probably is on fire. Uh, large scale event is another way uh, to, to quantify that. Uh, this is a uh, Xbox Live is offline uh, sort of a thing. Yeah, okay, you're allowed to say everything's on fire when that happens. Um, when things are on fire in my organization, uh, my cert uh, over there has a wall full of Luigi hats, wall Luigi hats in this case, uh, that they're supposed to put on for SEV1 uh, and large scale events. Uh, so far they have not done so, and I'm hoping that this is a talisman uh, against that in the future. Um, so let's go hit, uh, this won't get better under current management. And this is the single biggest thing that I had to realign my brain on uh, when I tried to go counter cynicism in management, which is, Cupcake, you are the management. Everything that's going wrong, you have a certain level of responsibility for solving, and that goes up um, as you climb the management team in most large companies. Uh, in, in Twitch, uh, which again, as an Amazon sub, we have taken some of their cultural uh, bits and pieces internally, uh, there's this fulcrum uh, at L7, which coincidentally is also the level that I operate at. Um, and it's been described to me many times, and the way it's been described to me is, um, at six, um, you are focused uh, on the execution of your team uh, and how your team contributes to the business objectives uh, of your org, uh, to the company. Um, at eight, you are a keeper of risk for the organization. Your first thought should be of the company and how things uh, move the key indicators for the company itself. Um, and at seven, you are the fulcrum uh, between those two things and you should be um, learning how to balance that between your team and the needs of the organization. Uh, and so when I say friend, you are the management, um, at some point, you are implicitly responsible for everything that is wrong with the management. And so saying that this is the management's fault is inherently cynical. Um, in my experience, I have found that I spend half of my time executing, um, half of my time managing my people, who I love very much, uh, and half of my time managing up. Uh, and at this point, you probably realize that's 150%. Um, if you've found a role or position where management is a 100% job, uh, do please contact me. Uh, I'd like to hear from you later. 
But the point is, uh, managing upward is a skill that as a nascent manager, um, you are absolutely going to need and you should not treat it, like managing up sounds like, oh, God, I can't believe I have to get my boss to go do this thing. Um, your boss does not have the visibility on the horizon to be able to respond to all inputs, all stimuli, all threats. And um, a good boss, a good manager is relying on his people or her people to be that extra set of eyes. I absolutely could not function in my role if Grant, who's here, and other Grant, who's also here, and Graham back at the shop, and Bach, and, and Kate, if they were not bringing things to my attention, if they were not managing me up, I could not be effective at my job. And by the same token, um, I make sure that my EVPs are spending their extraordinarily limited cycles looking at the right problems, responding to the right threats, um, which is basically what I just said um, one bullet ago. So we're one bullet ahead. I don't know if we can recover this. So uh, moving on, here's another favorite. Uh, those clowns don't know what they're doing. Uh, now we're getting into team dynamics, cynicism within team dynamics. Um, you can read this comment a couple of different ways. Um, if it's true that those clowns don't know what they're doing, that onus is on you. Ignorance is rarely intangible, intentional. Ignorance is always curable. And I firmly believe that as the communicator, the onus of the success of the communication is on you, not on the recipient. And so if those clowns don't know what they're doing, you are equally culpable in that problem. And you should not be thinking about this as, these guys don't know what they're doing, there's nothing I can do here, I'm gonna go move on and find a better partner team uh, or someone else that I can work with. Um, there's also the comment here, which is if, if these guys are so ignorant, are you targeting your training right? Do you have the right curriculum? Are you talking to the right people? Are you saying the right words? Are you building the right decks? The answer to that question is probably no. And that's in your wheelhouse to fix. Um, frequently, what's going on here is you actually have a mismatch of expectations or resources or priorities or some combination um, of all of the above thing. And so the one value that I can instill upon you here is you escalate. Escalate, escalate, escalate. This is the one thing that will save you more than anything else when you're moving forward in your career is it is absolutely okay, as I found out through repeated failure, to ask someone smarter or more experienced than you um, to help you solve a problem. And that is the, the single most valuable thing I get out of my executive management is, Ethan, I do not know what to do here. Help me fix this. So um, you'll note that we've moved to a second set of slides that have clowns uh, as the theme. Anyone here from Zynga would know what's going on. Don't seem to have any Zynga people here, so do please ask me about the clown thing later because I will not do it here. Um, it's very difficult to actually ascertain uh, how hard another team is working or not working. You don't know their workflows, you don't know their on-call schedules, although I suppose their on-call schedules you can, you can introspect through tooling. Um, you don't know how hard another team is working and it is extraordinarily presumptuous to assume that a team has checked out. The only real way you should ever even make that assumption if you have clear indicators in business metrics um, that, that, that isn't actually true. And even if you've made that determination, you're not the cops. Um, this is an escalation situation and everything should be about um, the actual metrics and not about the team's disposition or the presumption that they've checked out. Um, I know a lot of people uh, in my space uh, that work from 10 a.m. Uh, to 3.30 p.m. And the reason they do that is because they are then slinging email and writing one pagers and getting it done from uh, midnight forward because that's when they have the time available to do it. Just don't make assumptions about what people are doing or why they're doing it. Um, and this is the dangerous one, uh, that the clowns are arguing in bad faith or they're acting in bad faith or whatever the verb happens to be that bad faith is in play here. Um, this is an extraordinarily dangerous piece of cynicism that you can take with you and one that I caution you against at all costs um, because the odds are that's not actually true. And furthermore, there are risks to operating in that posture, one of which is that countering what you presume to be bad faith puts you in a bad faith reaction cycle and can make it look like you yourself um, are acting in bad faith, which is not to say that teams 
are never acting in bad faith. That is a thing that happens all the time, everywhere. But bad faith cycles break trust. They make it extraordinarily difficult to restore trust, and they require executive intervention to unwind. And as we've already discussed previously, your exec is already very busy dealing with all the other bullshit that you've escalated to them, and perhaps you should figure out how to work successfully with other teams on your own, L7. So, that was a lot on um, identifying cynicism, or at least how I um, have picked up keywords uh, and phrases that I use to, to key me in that cynicism is in play here. Um, let's talk about what you can do to counter that, or at least uh, what myself, uh, my team, through successive iterations uh, have come to as, as counter uh, to cynicism. And the first is strong tenets, which we're gonna go into in a little bit more detail. Um, the second is uh, the notional difference between sticks and carrots. Um, there was a prior version of this talk that was all about sticks and carrots, and I decided that it would have been very thematically appropriate um, for the theme here, uh, but we decided not to go that direction. Uh, and then, of course, a quick uh, note to take as much PTO that you can possibly take in any and all environments you ever work in. Um, so let's go through tenants a little bit. First bullet actually says it uh, as cleanly as possible, which is your team needs tenants. And if your team does not have tenants, you should go out there and you should make them. Or you should ask for assistance to make them. Or you should talk to someone who has tenants and say, by what process did you arrive at what you arrived at? Team tenants serve as a backstop to literally everything you do. It's an expression of sometimes what, but more frequently how and why your team does what it does. In action, your tenants should resolve conflicts for you with minimal effort. They shouldn't generate conflict. Consequently, in generation, your tenants should be controversial. They should make you question long-held assumptions about how your program operates, your role in the program, your program's role in the greater organization. Um, they should be crafted with the input of people you consider peers, people you consider rivals, people you consider customers. They should be workshopped from every direction. You should be able to recite your tenets. I can't, but I have a slide with them, so that counts. Um, but more importantly, you should be able to defend your tenets, because if you went through the arduous process to come up with the correct tenets for your organization and its role uh, in the company, they're very easily defendable. So uh, with that said, let's talk a little bit through uh, Twitch Security's tenets. These are the, the overriding binding bylaws by which my team operates, and it is our fallback and last readout uh, when we are in conflict. And the first tenet arguably is the most important tenet, and I'm gonna talk about it in more detail, but I do want to say, uh, just taking the side here, um, as I mentioned, Twitch is an AWS subsidiary. Um, we're basically the only AWS subsidiary with our own security program, which is an extraordinarily uh, rare thing. Um, and when we were first standing up this program, I was asked to put together a thesis of what I was going to do for this program, and so I produced um, a 30-page document with appendices in great detail about what was security um, and what security meant to the company and what my AppSec team was going to do and what my CERT was going to do and how quickly they were going to respond to things and when they were going to smile and when they were going to frown. It was a very detailed document. I was extremely proud of it. And we got into the review meeting with AWS security executives uh, and Eric Brandwine, uh, who is an L10 over there, extraordinarily brilliant uh, individual, uh, vice president IC, which is a thing you can do at large companies, uh, invented VPCs, et cetera, et cetera. He's got a LinkedIn, go read it. Um, Eric read that tenet, and Eric said, okay, I think we're good here. We protect Twitch's users, employees, and the company in that order, with no exceptions. That is an extraordinarily powerful statement and influences vast quantities of the things that you do. Um, it indicates how hard you push to make a customer notification when things have gone to hell. It indicates how hard you push when a product release is going to endanger your customers. I have gained lifetimes of efficiency by being able to go back to that tenant and say, I understand your position, however, our tenants dictate that we must act as such and you're going to have to escalate if you want me to budge on this one. Um, 
Tenant One built my program. Tenant One sustains my program. And with any luck, uh, Tenant One's going to make me rich. We'll see. Um, <laughs> remember that cynicism thing? Um, tenant Two uh, is bending Twitch's culture towards secure practices and patterns. Thank you. The scrolling is perfect. Um, Tenet 2 addresses the what have you done for me lately uh, sort of activity. Twitch has a long haul. I'm sure many of your companies have long hauls, deep strategic debt, things that happened in the past that now to be corrected in the future. Um, Tenet 2 sets the stage that this is a journey and we are not going to make spot fixes. And year over year, quarter over quarter, we are going to make successive improvements to our program and you, are along for the ride. And we are going to come to you as partners for assistance in this ride. And so I think it's fantastic that you implemented service to service authentication last quarter for us, but we are not done with you. Tenant three, also a HAL tenant. Um, controls fail, plan for failure. And um, I had a great uh, illustration for this that's in a deck that I can't share with you in this context, but I can tell you about it. Uh, which is we had a guy break into our office uh, at 4 a.m. Uh, and we've got him on all sorts of cameras. Uh, and he, he went into the front lobby of our building uh, and the guard waved him through because he was wearing a suit. Now, it was a cheap suit and the tie was terrible. But that's not what the guards are interested in um, at the front door. So they led him to the elevator banks and he rode the elevator up to um, eight. Rode the elevator up to eight. Um, and we have those like really cool acrylic uh, slidey guys um, the thing about the really cool acrylic slidey guys is that they must have a default pressure by which they can be leveraged apart for fire code reasons, and that number is 30 pounds. Um, this one was set to 15 for whatever reason, and so he just kind of walked up to the thing and slid his way through and then moseyed in through the next uh, door, which was held open because there had been a party previous that evening and the alarms had been disabled. And so uh, he bypassed another security control because it was not even turned on. Uh, and he wandered around on camera in front of someone's desk and he rifled through it quick. He found the laptop and he found some other stuff and he walked out the front door. Um, so the thing that saved our bacon is we have ubiquitous laptop encryption, full disk, everywhere, all the time, enforce it. One final backstop control solved this problem. Now we could have, to use this metaphor, we could have installed man traps at all of our entrances. We could have military grade access control to our facilities. We could have one single extraordinarily high efficacy control that can fail. Or we can layer kind of shitty controls and we can play the, the, the multiplicative numbers and somewhere in that kill chain, something is going to trip and we're getting at our outcome. Now, in this particular case, it was the last possible control that could have tripped. Actually, I guess that's not true. Could have also not known how to use a computer when he opened it. And I guess that would have worked out in our favor. But point being, um, this is a philosophical underpinning of how we do what we do. We are going to layer multiplicative low friction controls to make your life easier, but to keep us secure. And we're not gonna implement the big ones, so stop asking. Uh, finally, um, Sunshine is the best disinfectant, and this is an extraordinarily powerful tenant. You probably, many of you, believe this already, but have you actually laid it down on paper? Have you actually have the fight that builds this tenant? Have you actually said legal, we are going to share the details of this security incident with the entire engineering organization of this company because they need to know and our tenant is transparency. If you've had that fight and put the results of that fight on paper, you now have an extraordinarily powerful educational tool for your organization. You can leverage the power of crises, the power of incidents, the power of things going wrong, and use that as an educational tool, which is extraordinarily powerful. Um, and without this tenant, that would be a constant struggle every time we want to do that. Hey, can we release the details on CERT 3916? No. Why? No. All right. It's not helpful. So um, those are my tenants, um, and I'm not saying that you should adopt my tenants, but what I am saying is you should have tenants, because tenants codify that you're on a mission. The mission has value. They offer you a moral underpinning to what you are doing as a team, and tenants slay cynicism. So you should get some. Uh, let's talk a little bit about sticks and carrots. Um, we've experimented with both uh, quite heavily. Sticks and carrots are like drugs. We find that carrots tend to get partner teams much more excited than sticks. Um, again, it sounds uh, plebeian, but it's, it, it's very true. Um, we find that carrots get our internal teams excited. Uh, and finally, 
uh, there's an implied gap between a carrot and a stick uh, that I like to refer to as implied shame uh, that I want to talk about very briefly. Uh, we're, we're getting late in time here, I think, and I want to make sure everyone's got Q&A. Um, also be careful about weaponizing shame, uh, which I don't believe I've actually put a slide to, uh, but the point here is that um, shame should be a sometimes food, uh, and you should not build and program uh, on shame. But the implied shame between we're going to praise you for this and we're going to punish you for that is actually very powerful. So um, the most effective carrot that I have found personally within my own program uh, is the all hands, company all hands. Now, some companies cannot do that. Uh, Twitch is kind of weird in that at X people, I don't think I'm actually allowed saying how many people we are. Um, at our size, we can still do a weekly all hands. It's available in our cafeteria. It's available on video conference. It's not available over Twitch. It's an important distinction. Make sure your product do what it's designed for, not what other people want it to do. Um, and we use that. Um, and you should be able to go and challenge anyone who says this is not important or we do not have time for this agenda because being able to talk to the entire company about security things is a very powerful motivator. Um, here are some examples. Um, hey, security just launched version two of service to service off. Uh, and we'd like to give a shout out to the API teams that rolled out with us at launch. CSI, please stand up, come forward, let's talk about this. Round of applause, everyone's very happy. People love this. Um, the teams that were already participating with us on the S2S campaign were highly engaged. I mean, they were engaged before, obviously, but were highly engaged thereafter. Uh, the teams that were adjacent to them started asking how to get involved. Hey, we didn't know about this. This is awesome. You mean that we can we can block random calls to this API. We've been looking for something like this. And finally, uh, the teams that had absolutely no idea what was going on whatsoever or were furthest away from the problem started asking us questions about what we were doing and why. That's positive engagement, it's fantastic. Another, excuse me, uh, another good example here is, hey, we've kicked off our 2018 threat modeling initiatives and we'd like to invite the clients team up to this podium to throw their threat model up on the board um, and talk about how they arrived at this, to talk about how they think about what threat actors want uh, out, of their, uh, out of their organization, um, how all of their bits and pieces play together. Clients team you know, does a presentation. Um, you, know, you do this and the request tickets to get a threat model start rolling in the door. Um, side note, now you become the blocker to getting your objectives done, which you never want to be. Uh, but that's an awesome thing. Um, <laughs> Twitch may actually get itself threat modeled in 2018, which is just fucking fantastic. Very happy about that. Um, carrots are great for your internal teams as well. Um, my security team, absolutely no different. Um, engineers want recognition, and we know that because we asked them what they wanted, and they told us. It's a very powerful thing asking people what they want in a context where they feel they can be truthful with you. You'll be very surprised what you learn. Um, we perform engagement surveys at Twitch. Uh, Amazon does this as well. Um, and when an engagement survey says people are not happy with their environment, their reward, their recognition, whatever factors uh, are in play, they will score you low. Um, and then as a manager, it is your responsibility to go in and find out why that is, to ask the questions around why are you not engaged, what can I fix about recognition for you? Um, and the reason for that is, like, moving the ball forward in an environment where you carry a lot of historical and strategic debt, it can feel like a never-ending slog. It can lead to all of those quotes we covered earlier in the identifying cynicism section of this talk. These guys are clowns, it never ends, everything's on fire, and you need to motivate people that this is going to be a slog, but we're going to win it. And it's important to take regular moments to recognize all of the good things that come out of winning the small battles that make up that slog. Um, also, your internal stand-ups are opportunities to call out achievements, large and small. If your stand-up is just about sprint planning, you are wasting a number of great things you can get out of your daily stand-up, and I recommend that you put recognition into that process. Um, something that we, uh, and this is a managing up thing, uh, something that one of my managers said, hey, Dibler, you know what we should really do? We should do a team retro, and he was absolutely correct. Um, your team should have an annual retrospective about all of your accomplishments, and you should not drive it, which is to say, I should not drive it. Um, your managers and your engineers should be able to come in and say, this is what we're going to talk about in this retro, because this is what was valuable to us. And then you buy them lunch, 
and then you recognize it, and it's a great meeting. So I mentioned the implied shame gap. Um, this is kind of shortcut and it works for Twitch. I don't know if this is going to work anywhere else, but I am going to point it out here. Um, so this is a positive report. This is the carrot report. This is, hey, who are the teams that met their patching compliance objectives? Video ingest and the Xbox client and IT engineering. Fantastic. This is the stick version of that report. These are the teams that are out of patch compliant. Managers, please, please smack them. VPs, please withhold promotions from them. I'm not implying you should do any of these things, but th these are sticks. Um, does not work as well. Um, what I have found works really well in our environment and might work well in yours is the implied shame. You provide the positive. You say, these are all the fantastic teams that have done fantastic work for us over the last quarter, and, and these are all the other teams that exist. This is your denominator. Uh, people hate being on there, but they can't tag you for having a stick. Um, it becomes an extraordinary peer pressure moment uh, where it's like managers come back and say, how are we going to get blue on this next report? Um, and then they will be. So um, balance your positive and negative feedbacks. I'm a fan of positive, but most importantly, carrots slay cynicism and also contain beta carotene, which you need to live. So um, final slide, uh, or, or rather one of the final slides. <clears throat> Cannot recommend enough uh, PTO. Try to have hobbies that aren't security. Security is an amazingly vast space, uh, and there are so many disciplines at it that you can have a profession in security, and a hobby security, and a speaking job in security, and you can have a Twitch channel or a Mixer channel about security. I don't know if they'll let you do that. Um, do something else. Um, personally, I grow peppers. Um, I grow jalapenos. Uh, they're now all dead. Uh, they got thrips, and uh, we did a very small harvest of what we could get out of them. It was all very tragic. Fiance and I are very upset, but that is not security. Um, I fly drones now, which it turns out is much more possible in the Redmond area than it is anywhere close to where I live, and I probably should have dropped my uh, brought my Mavic with me, but I did not. Uh, but that's uh, some photos from Fort Funston. Uh, my fiance and I travel, and uh, being an architect, we take lots of photos of really, really crazy architecture. This is uh, right by the, uh, the World Trade Center Memorial. Um, I don't even know how to describe this space other than the first time I walked into it, I said, this must be a panorama. And I pulled out the phone and started wandering around like this. This is what you do in pano mode. Uh, and finally, as you might expect working at Twitch, though it's not a requirement that helps an awful lot, I play an awful lot of video games. Um, because I suck at Rocket League, Kirk. <laughs> Why are you bronze in Overwatch? God. I do love Rocket League, though. Um, and if you uh, swing back to the very beginning of this deck, uh, my Twitch channel uh, is on the front. And every Wednesday night, a small group of us play video games like no one's watching, because no one is. <laughs> so uh, if this isn't enough motivation uh, to do what you do, uh, here are a couple other quick tips uh, on what keeps me going uh, through the day. Uh, and the first of which is you need to find a product you care about. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I did not care about internet payments. And though I notionally cared about Zynga, I really didn't care about scaling. And I did not care about enterprise sync and share and being the threat aggregator of literally every threat actor on the planet Earth. Uh, what I can tell you is I care very deeply about video games and I care very deeply about the people who play video games and I care very deeply about making sure that we do not give up the farm on them because that is just embarrassing. So having a product you care about, extremely valuable. Um, having people you care about, extremely valuable. Um, I've worked with some of the finest people I have ever met. Uh, I've had the privilege of wandering around with mostly the same pod for the last eight years. Um, that's something that happens very commonly in security. Um, and people will float out and people will float back in and we'll all go to different places. Uh, but caring about your coworkers as humans, though absolutely not required in security, I highly recommend it. You try it sometime. And thirdly, find a mentor you can trust. Um, get someone who can call your bullshit. That's one of the most valuable things that I ever got. And like we walked through the earlier part of this deck, I have been wandering through this career for 20 years. Um, getting someone who can say, it's okay that you don't know what you're doing, but here's three places you went wrong, and here's how I'd suggest three ways you fix that, because you're gonna take another run at it, and you're gonna do better next time. Incredibly valuable, and if you don't have that person, 
you should find that person. If you don't know how to find that person, you should ask for someone who has that person and get them to help you. If you work for a large organization, you probably have a mentor-mentee program. I'm not saying that's the way you get that job done, but you have resources available to you, and if you don't, you ask. Um, if you don't have any of these things at your current job, there are places you can get them. This is absolutely not a recruiting deck, but you are not bound to where you live, and if there are things you want out of your career, it is incumbent upon you to go find them. So, um, this is more or less where I landed. Uh, that is a giraffe smoking a cigarette. Um, I was running out of giraffe photos uh, that were royalty free and had transparency in the background, and so this is kind of the bottom of the barrel, but that's important because this is basically the last slide in the deck. Um, I came into the premise of this talk burnt out. Um, building this talk reminded me of everything that I care about in this industry and everything I care about as a professional in this industry. And most importantly, it reminded me that I should be telling people about that on a regular basis. And so I would like to thank Blue Hat for offering me the opportunity to come in here and reaffirm my faith and uh, go back happy and refreshed. Oh God, probably tomorrow morning. All right, can we do another 30 slides? Any questions? Thank you. How, how, does, how does this work? You got mic runners. Are there any questions for Chris? No questions is great because I need water. Perfect. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, Thank you. It was a great talk. Appreciate it.